Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Doctora Ramos a la sala de espera. Hay un problema que afecta a muchos niños que no puedo resolver sola. Se llama estrés tóxico y esto aumenta el riesgo de problemas de salud. Pero hay pasos que los padres pueden tomar para superar el estrés tóxico. Aprende cómo en first5california.com. Hello world, I'm Tim Whiffen and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Episode 86 of Strategicon is part 2 of a 2 episode conversation. If you have not already listened to episode 85 of Strategicon, I highly recommend going back and listening to that episode as it will provide context for this conversation about the recent cyber aggression Australia received of which China has been accused by the Australian media. In this episode of Strategicon, we'll be joined from the UK by Commodore Patrick J. Thurl, OBE, Royal Navy Retired, Chair of the SAGE International Australia Management Board and SIA's Senior Non-Resident Fellow Global and Maritime Security. Also from the UK, Pete Warren, Editor of Future Intelligence and Chair of the Cyber Security Research Institute, and Professor Andrew Jones of the University of Suffolk, and also author of Global Information Warfare. Today's topic, China attacks. The PRC's June 2020 cyber attack on Australia and what this means for Sino-Australian relations. Joining us via Zoom in our virtual studio today is co-host David Olney. Hello, David. Good evening, good morning, and good something to everyone. (laughs) And our producer, Tim Whiffen. Hello, Tim. It's very nice to be here. Before we start today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. I, I, I want to just quick, briefly go back to the, the previous point. We mentioned earlier that you know, cyber terrorism is a, is a theory. Uh, it, it, it seems logical to me that then cyber war should also be kind of in that theoretical category that we shouldn't necessarily label it war if it's, let's say, not been kind of proven to be that. And obviously you guys are obviously in favor of kind of changing that language a bit anyway. But mm. the, the word that I wanted to focus on, which I think Pat brought up, was attrition, which seems to be the um, Chinese kind of status quo, right? It's, it's it, especially in our case uh, in, in Australia, it seems to be the continual pressuring and pushing the boundaries and just pushing on those pressure points uh, with with Australia to to kind of establish themselves as as that kind of big kid as the bigger player as dominant dominant force in that relationship and that that's going to happen you would imagine in 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 every kind of possible way so you know as as advanced as we are we're still kind of We've mentioned this before. We're still we're educating Chinese students, and then they will head back to their homeland and and basically take all of that with them. So we've not been particularly protective of our kind of cyber assets, let's say, in in the sense that you know, we haven't been putting up you know firewalls. And you guys have kind of been talking about like the borders, let's say, uh, you guys have been talking about as well. But we've also not been protective of our training in that area as well. Even if we were the the more advanced, if that's what you would like to call it, even if we were that force, we're not doing anything to, uh, let's say, stop enemies or people we're in conflict with from kind of sapping that information. So it, it kind of, it, it doesn't really seem like there's much point in kind of asserting whether we're more, you know, advanced or, or less advanced if realistically they have access to all of our advancements anyway. That's, I don't know, that's just what I think. But. <laughs> just before we get to, to Andy, I just need to uh, say something here. And that is that I think that really comes down to the fact that there are, there are states in the world that are highly motivated. And yes, they have capacities like China has capacities because of their you know, educational exchange programs. But they have a will and they have a plan and they're not shy of actually implementing it. But they also know something else about us. They know that we're vulnerable, not just from a technological standpoint, but from a political standpoint. Because, you know, when confronted with 
like, you know, Australia has been recently confronted by this, you know, Chinese attack reputedly, we're not going to do too much. We can't really do too much. And I think that that knowledge is, a, is as much part of the whole information war thing, but also a psychological operation at the same time, because they kind of almost expect that we're not going to say anything that's going to necessarily be too offensive to the Chinese because then that'll give the Chinese a free kick and so on and so forth. But is that because we, 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 that we think that, or the common thought is that we can't do anything about it or is it actually because we can't do anything about it? I guess that's well, well, actually that leads, that leads to a, a, you know, that's a segue into something that we can actually pursue after we've, uh, we've had Andy, Andy, please. (laughs) Uh, Picking up on, couple of points, one from Peter and one from Tim. Tim, uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right about the language and so forth. But the reality is Australia is a very big trading partner with China. Uh, Certainly when you move to Western Australia and you look at Rio Tinto and the like. But also your education system and the income in that sector. So, you know, it's it's a partnership where they buy from you an imbalanced partnership, I would suggest. So in reality, something you have to deal with. But going back to Peter's point, he raised a very good point about what people's understanding of right and wrong is and how we educate them. And the reality is, you know, we have a very Western mentality and way of looking at things. So our view of what's right and what's wrong is very different from the Chinese view of what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable. Uh, and we have to understand their perspective if we're going to deal with them. Actually, uh, our resident existentialist philosopher is just sitting there, and he needs to chime in here because, come on, David, you've got to, <laughs> you're yeah. going to have to have an opinion on this one. Oh, look, it, it's just a case of a question of commitment. Most of the last five or six issues we've been talking about all come down to the same thing. People who want something and can become committed can maintain the pressure to achieve attrition on us because we're not committed enough to apply attrition back on them. We will sell the Chinese any education they're willing to pay for without thinking about the consequences because thinking about the consequences would hurt. That would be a form of attrition in itself. We would have to surrender making money by throwing shit away and giving it away freely. And that's just commitment has been the most consistent thing in human history in all forms of conflict and competition the most committed person may fail early but they tend to learn and as long as they can stay committed and with the patriotic education policy china pours out millions of 20 year olds every year with 15 to 16 years of patriotic education policy giving them a level of competition and commitment that makes them you know truly dangerous to the rest of the world I'm wondering, there is something called quantum computing, which apparently is now something that the Chinese have taken a huge lead on. But, you know, the US and Japan, they also have their own quantum computing capacities. And I understand the nature of commerce in the world. You know, every, all roads lead to, to China at the, at the moment. In spite of COVID, I know that we're going to be repatriating plant at some point and, you know, making China a little bit more manageable and smaller uh, as an entity. But that's going to take some time to actually achieve. In the meantime, we are caught up in this info war. We do have technical capabilities But is it because of the interlinkages in commerce and the fact that our political classes tend to pay homage to the business class and the business class wants to make money out of China, that the political class feels constrained that they cannot act with a a free hand? Well, that seems very clear. In Australia, for example, Mm -hmm. the business elite lean on the political elite. Yeah. In China and Russia, the political elite lean on the business elite. And if the business elite want to continue to be the business elite, Mm -hmm. they find a way to make money and to fit the long-term view. And therein lies our vulnerability. And our our vulnerability until their own people recognise they suffer the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. So you're at the whim of the system breaking rather than us competing with it. If I can turn to Pat for his view on this. I mean, you are describing, of course, the 
fundamental fissure that exists between uh, authoritarian states and democracies. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, you know, a democracy is a pretty poor way of running a government, but it's the least worst. And of course, we in the West champion individualism within a democratic framework. Authoritarian regimes champion the regime and there is no such thing as individuality. People have to be supporting the regime. So, I mean, in China, that, of course, is expressed in Confucianism, that the individual is subordinate to the whole. And as long as you have these fundamental differences, we will have the fractures that we see in the world at the moment. And, uh, you know, there was a rather naive view that said we need to have more Chinese students coming over because they'll be exposed to democracy. They'll begin to understand the great advantage that democracy can give them. They can play a role as individuals. And China... Of course, we tried this with Russia, of course, in the 1990s, and uh, it certainly hasn't worked over the last 20 years. And, you know, we can only now wait and hope that it will be the Chinese middle classes who, as they go in their increasing numbers to visit overseas and everything else. I mean, if you look at the change in meat consumption in China, it is growing at a huge rate because the middle classes say, I want to eat meat not once a day, and not once a week, I want to eat it every day of the week. And I want choice cuts of meat. Uh, And I want to be able to buy the things I want to buy. And of course, as that middle class grows, hopefully so will, what was it that Maslow called it, the self-actualization, you know, the view of I as an individual want to have more control of my life, because when that happens, their future horizons will become more Western and will be looking on a year-to-year basis ahead. How can I improve my life and my children's life rather than following a traditional Confucian view that says, how can I make sure that my descendants in a hundred or 200 years time can have a better society in which to live? Uh, Can I rain on your parade for a sec? Of course you can, David. (laughs) I think one of the problems we have now is that historically middle class has had power in transforming countries because they couldn't leave. Whereas what we see now with China, and it's data they're very careful about protecting, is the rate at which millionaires leave. They don't stay there and try and change the system. They take the money they can make within a corrupt authoritarian state and disappear as rapidly as possible by situating their kids in the West and then following if they possibly can. So unfortunately, what we're seeing here with a massive population is they can bear the brain drain in a way that historically wouldn't have been possible. And the Russians are doing the same. Yes. Doesn't the UK have the largest expat Russian population in Europe? Da. Yes, da. (laughs) (laughs) You might get to see Olga sometime, Pat. (laughs) Or Svetlana. (laughs) Yes, Well, look, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious uh, what uh, Pete has to say with regard to vulnerabilities, because, you know, when we talk about vulnerabilities, it's easy to get caught up in the technology because, of course, that's the front end of things. That's the things that we can see. It's the things that we can, we can get our heads around. But really, the incomprehensibility of our political processes, and you deal with politicians a lot, Pete, over the years. I mean, you would have seen how commercial interests in London 
may very well have trumped political interests. And the idea that we were talking about earlier of having some sort of mandated policies whereby government can do something in terms of protecting various companies that are critical to to the running of, say, the UK or Australia, for that matter. I mean, these kind of things would have, you'd have to bring the business elites on board. They'd all have to be singing off the same song sheet as the government. Otherwise, they'll put up so much resistance that anything that you try would be pointless, right? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I had, and and indeed, a message has just flashed across my screen from a politician while we've been talking, who I'm talking to. Great minds. (laughs) And, and that politician was, a, it was a, it, an enormously powerful politician in terms of technology. So I'm going to be quite careful what I'm, I'm going to say. <laughs> it, my, my experience of working with politicians, and this is going to be a terrible thing to say, is that most of them know nothing about technology. Mm. They really do not know anything about technology. I uh, had a meeting in the House of Commons, or the Houses of Parliament, in fact, with a former Home Secretary who started telling me about this terrible thing called information war and how he was going to sort of put together a, um, a think tank to do, to do with it. And I, let's call him John. I said, John... People have been doing this for years, mate. <laughs> you know, what you're talking about at the moment, you're seven years behind the curve. And he looked at me in quite a shocked way. And I was thinking, let's call him Harry. Um, yeah, you, you, Better. You're, a form, you're, you're a former Home Secretary. <laughs> you know? He was too busy Why with didn't Svetlana somebody... for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, somebody was evidently not telling you much. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that, that's an issue, uh, and a, a massive issue, because if you want to get something changed, then the politicians have to understand. You know, currently, I'm trying to get in contact with Lord Maud, um, who's Francis Maud, who was the, um, I, I think his last role was a, was a Cabinet Office Secretary. Um, so, Francis, if you can hear... Um, I, can you please pick up the phone? Uh, the, the reason I wanted to get a hold of him was because he was seen as, as, by the civil servants as being very effective because he got technology. He was the person who actually pushed through the cyber insurance that was necessary to underpin the, 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 the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, because, surprise, surprise, you need deniability. You, you need to be, actually have somebody to say, "Yes, I have had a breach." You have to put that infrastructure uh, up. I, I was actually in meetings with Francis Maud and the insurance industry, and I made the point on their behalf, saying, "You're trying to get the insurance industry to underwrite the costs of cyber breaches without giving them the information on which to base their risk." And why on earth should they do that? You know, you've got to get people to put their hands up and say, yes, I've been breached, so you can get some actual handle on what's going on. So I'm, I'm going to be really boring and bang on about the thing that I have been saying about you have to have some means of knowing what's going on built into the network, and we signally failed to do that. And I know I've said that over and over and over again. I think that to go to something that David said, well, when David was saying about, you know, they've got more commitment and we need more commitment, that reminded me of General Buck Turgidson in Dr. Strangelove when he was saying, okay, we're going to bomb the hell out of each other um, and we'll let's get into the coal mines, but let's make sure that we've got more Svetlanas and Olgas in our coal mines so that we can breed better than they can. You know, unless you get out of that mindset of, we're always going to be in this permanent competition. Well, you will be in permanent competition because you won't have grown up. Um, in terms of what Pat was saying about trying to educate middle classes and everybody eating more meat and hoping that's going to change, well, unfortunately, what's going to happen there is we're going to keep, advance rapidly towards more climate change, which was somewhere where we were before all of this. That's not good. Um, I think... Yeah, obviously we have, uh, as you say, David here as our existential philosopher. The, the that's what we need. Bizarrely, I interviewed Professor Luci. Well, it wasn't bizarre that I interviewed him. Professor Luciano Greedy, 
who is a professor of philosophy and ethics at Oxford, who has now become the advisor to the Turing Institute, or, uh, and was advising, is, is now advising the government, or is one of the increasing amount of advisors that the, the government is, has from ethics uh, to do with technological development. And Floridi was, was making a joke that it was very amusing for him that philosophers were now being brought in to make pragmatic decisions. Uh, it's probably not you know, behind times. Um, it is, and to go to a, a, a point, another point that was made, which I think by Tim, you know, I, I think that w we keep on talking in an outdated language and in an outdated mindset about what's going on. We've got something called social media, which is a sort of expression of, uh, you know, certain elements in our national consciousness of, of certain motivations. I think that what we're seeing in cyber warfare is almost like nation state social media. And we haven't quite got to grips with the fact that, you know, people are slagging each other off and, and finding this new mechanism as a means of political coercion. Um, then there's a final couple of points I want to make, which is, again, Andy mentioned Rio Tinto. Well, way back, there were a lot of examples of, of theft of information from Rio Tinto, which goes back to the Nortel thing. And what, what the Chinese were doing was stealing information from uh, Australian mining companies because it wanted to affect the futures market in its own interests. And we've got to realize that those things are you know, as important as uh, the, the, this alleged well, the, the theft of intellectual property. And finally, in my you know, high speed rant, I, I do go back to, you know, th th this thing about mandating. If you want to have the cyber security that protects Australia, protects the UK, protects other, other New Zealand, then what you've got to do is the government has to actually step in, and this goes back to, the, to Pat's report, and it has to say, okay, we know that cybersecurity is difficult for you. We also know that Olga and Svetlana keep knocking on your door. So what we're going to do is say, in the same way that the, 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 the government has said that there are four companies that major um, corporates should go to in the event of them thinking that they've been hacked, they should also say, there are these other companies that you can go to. They can take this whole nightmare of cyber off your heads use those companies and they'll protect you and that's where your comeback is you know again it's growing into the 21st century it's understanding the way the 21st century works and i'm sorry for ranting on so many different levels that's all right no problems we're going to move on to andy <laughs> oh, difficult to follow beat after a rant <laughs> 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 I, I do think he makes some good points there though you know we have to change the mindset we have to change uh the way we're thinking about the problem and yeah you know one of the issues in uk of course is that a lot of the cni isn't owned by uk companies it's owned by overseas companies and corporations uh which makes life more difficult if you're going to uh levy them to uh put funds in to provide security because they're saying you know business risk uh mm. you know we're prepared to tolerate a level of uh, disruption because the cost of not is too high it, pat will remember we were both in the military when we went from risk avoidance to risk management uh and at that time i was responsible for the security of military networks around the world and the way it was approached uh, was, yeah, we're not going to avoid risk anymore. We're going to realize that it, we can't afford it. Uh, so we're going to manage it. And who are we going to get to manage it? Uh, we're going to get all those people that used to avoid it to manage the, the new environment. And of course, the whole mindset was wrong you know, because they managed to manage risk by avoiding it. Uh, so we have moved on and it took a few years to sort of migrate into the new mentality uh, and I think we're in a similar situation now 
on a broader scale. I have a question that I hope someone would be able to answer because it's becoming increasingly obvious that I don't think there are any easy answers to anything that we're talking about right now. But just to add to the complication, how do we manage public expectations about information warfare? So from an Australian perspective, David and I do a lot of commentary in the local media, you know, and the media is an interesting beast, as of course Pete will know. That is that, you know, they try to reduce everything to a kind of simplified message. And I'm being very generous here. Right. But there, you know, when the prime minister of a country comes out and says, look, guys, we've been hacked. And then the media is going, oh, wow, who was it? And then, of course, you know, other people come in from left field, you know, usually from the Beltway or our version of the Beltway in Canberra. And all they do is stoke fire. What do we do or what should the media do in terms of managing public expectations at a time of non-kinetic hostility, strategic competition, information warfare, call it what you want? Because, of course, the public does have an expectation that Australia, in our case now, we're going to be striking back, right? The Chinese no, they have don't done have it. that expectation. Don't they? No, I think that's one thing the Australian population is very sure of, is that we won't do anything. <laughs> well, well, no, they know that we're not going to do anything, but I, I, I think that there's still that sort of subconscious expectation that, hey, listen, you know, uh, the government, they've got everything under control. They're going to be doing something. They're going to be doing something. What is that something? No, why why Australia wants them to do something. Yeah. Like, yeah. What was that? Oh, hang on a sec. Uh, David first and then Tim. So I was just saying, it, it's the desperate belief that somehow conservatives in Australia know what they're doing. <laughs> well, uh, you know. that, that, there's a desire to do something, um, but, the, the, but precisely the people that have that desire are, are precisely the audience that the uh, media has to dumb the message down for. Sorry, but that's just true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if... if <laughs> It depends on when you say what the media should do. Are you talking about in the interests of the people or in the interests of the media? Because well, no, in the interests of the people, I mean, I would like to say that there is such a thing as the interest of the public. <laughs> but uh, of course, you know, uh, in terms of how the public interact with the media, things usually go pear shaped. But I'm, I'm curious as to there will be some people out there in the in the in the community who will think, well, okay, look, you know, we've been hacked. Uh, odds are that it was China. It was a state actor. The prime minister said so. What will our response be? I mean, it, it's kind of like the, the, the whole standoff between China and, uh, and India over uh, um, um, the Himalayas there. It's just uh, one of those things where Modi gets thrown the ball and then he's kind of dropped it and he doesn't know how to respond. So he's sending out mixed messages all over the place. You know, uh, it, it, the, the Indian public obviously want to know where they're going with this whole brouhaha over China, as the Australian public, at least a percentage of, will want to know where the government is going with this cyber attack on Australia. How, how does that all work? Well, it won't work. We'll get racism on the streets because there won't be a government response that means anything or makes any sense to a genuine populace who haven't been educated in anything related to the topic like to say it's the media's responsibility when the prime minister has a communications team who appear to once again be incompetent can i just follow up on on david's point and and follow up from some uh, themes earlier on i mean i think you know in the old-fashioned sense we've got to mobilize the troops this is um very much a uh, pan um uh, Australian population pan community problem in whichever country you're in. You can do some short term things, which are you've got to make sure that people understand the nature of the threat. And you may have to do this in really simplistic terms, you know, um, in just the same way we've been tackling the COVID 19 pandemic. You know, you need some snappy lines you need to make sure that people don't expose their own personal computer systems they don't do you know they can understand the damage that can be done and then we need to pick up on the Estonian thing we need to make sure that the young people 
who, thank heavens, are probably going to understand this problem a lot better than we do, we need to make sure that they are exposed to the issues around this from a very young age. So they understand that there are people, uh, entities, individuals, groups, countries, whoever they may be, who will wish to damage our infrastructure. And if you go and look what happens in the Baltic nations now, even at the youngest of ages, they understand an awful lot more about cyber security. Now we can do that by putting it fundamentally into the education of young people. I've actually got written down here, education, education, which is, you know, not a Blairite statement. Um, the, uh, to go to your point about the media, the problem that you have with the media is the media have been pretty irresponsible about all of this. I, I spoke to a leading journalist last week um, who said that she, the only stories that she'd been tasked to do with, to do with uh, technology were, um, you know, internet child abuse, the, the, the normal sort of um, and, and, and nastiness on the internet, the normal sort of shock horror thing. The, the, me, the media does need to be more responsible. However, I personally uh, have been saying to news desks for about 30 years that they need to take technology more seriously. I, ha I can remember 30 years ago having a conversation with the deputy editor of the Sunday Mirror, trying to get him to do some stories about cybersecurity. And he turned around to me and said, Pete, mate, Pete, mate, there's only two things the public are interested in, sex and money, mate, sex and money, in that order. Um, and it hasn't really changed. That I, I had a conversation with the deputy editor of one of the most famous, the deputy news editor of one of the most famous broadsheets about a month ago. And I said, you've got to start doing more stuff about technology, more stuff about mainstream technology, technology because this is running our world. And he said, yeah, the, the problem is the readers. You know, we, we've, we've, we, we, we were having this discussion um, and we were saying, you've got to repeat a story at least 10 times for people to get an understanding. This is one of the most intellectual publications we have in the UK in terms of you know, newspapers and the media. So there, there is a responsibility on newspaper editors to start to take it seriously, but then they'll just come back and say, very much like Tony Frost, the, uh, the former deputy editor of the Sunday Mirror, who I think is the uh, editor or was the editor of the National Enquirer in America until just recently, is sex and money line because they're only doing that because they're in the business of selling newspapers. So you give the public what they want. So in a sense, we're in this horrible, uh, it's not a virtuous circle, it's a very, it's a very immoral circle. Uh, and, and that needs to be corrected, where everybody needs to start you know, taking more responsibility, being a bit more intellectual about this, not clicking on the terms and conditions, as Andy, Andy was saying. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I just want to... You, you, Pat says that the children are, are, are going to be better. No, they're, they're, they're better at understanding how apps work rather than actually understanding how computer systems work or sort of the morality of things. I despair when I look out of my window and see all of these children walking along with this thing in front of their faces because I'm sitting there thinking how readily they can actually be programmed and, and be uh, diverted by an information war working on social media to whip them up or whatever. The fact that they are so wedded to these devices seems to me to be a bit of a worry because that strikes me as digital dependency that you really need to sort of um, start dealing with. So, uh, yeah, educating, edu education, education. Though there is another factor in everything that w w we've been saying because some of the commentators, and this is not, and nothing to do with what I've just been talking about. Some of the commentators have been saying that the attack on Australia by China 
is because there is a perception among the Chinese that the Australians are the weak end of, for the five eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm glad that you raised that. What of the five eyes? I've heard now that, you know, Australia and the United States are starting to, you know, get a little bit, dare I say, closer in terms of trying to get on top of cyber. We want to now extend Five Eyes into the commercial domain. I mean, we want to actually recreate the Five Eyes to be the block against the Sino-Russian aggressors out there and all their various trolls. Is this a good thing or are we flogging a dead horse? I mean, Five Eyes was created for a, a set uh, group of issues. I mean, can we can we redevelop it? Can we can we turn it into the thing that will keep us all safe at night? Uh, maybe Pat will like have a go, and then Andy. Um, I think that uh, the Five Eyes in itself has a has an issue, um, which is uh, it was very clearly when it was started. It was a way of linking. Uh, five nations that had a very firmly white Anglo-Saxon background mm. together in sharing things together because we didn't trust Johnny Foreigner um, to be able to share them. So I think, you know, we, 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 we have a perception problem uh, from the outset. Um, and, uh, of course, at the same time, we want to have a group of us that have similar sorts of backgrounds, ambitions, visions for the future, etc. Um, and we're in a very difficult position at the moment in that we have um, one Donald Trump as President of the United States who is seemingly quite happy to dump uh, friends and allies at the drop of a hat when he doesn't feel that it fits into whatever um, dare I say it is his deranged image of the world at that moment in time so there are some issues that need to be overcome in this um, I think is you know cyber warfare an issue that affects all democracies Yes, it is. How can we get a better understanding of that in a broader context? You know, uh, India is one of the world's largest democracies. And yes, it has its problems, but tell me any democracy that doesn't. And, you know, we should be uh, involving them in some of these things. And I have to say, making use of their software skills that they have in abundance in um, in India. So, you know, that's my two penny worth, but we do have to be careful uh, of, of not talking up Five Eyes as being the greatest thing since sliced bread was invented. You mean sliced white bread? <laughs> oh, yeah. that was droll. <laughs> oh, boom, boom, okay, I know. <laughs> okay, Andy, what's your what's your view on the Five Eyes? I agree with Pat. I, I don't think probably it's the right platform. When it came into being, it had a function. I think we've moved beyond that. Mm. Uh, you can't ignore, first of all, you know, the rest of Europe. You can't ignore countries like uh, India. Uh, they need to be part of it, whatever it is. It does need to be multinational and international. It goes against the tenets of everything Five Eyes because it needs to be about sharing information broadly, which Five Eyes was never intended for. Uh, you know, in fact, it was quite the opposite. It was intended that it wasn't shared beyond the boundaries. So, no, it, it's not the right platform. Um, and when you talk about taking it from government and extending it into commercial, uh, you've got to start on a national level to do that. Uh, you've got to have a national level infrastructure that's capable of sharing that sort of information. And, you know, to some degree, you have the core, uh, as do most of the developed nations. Uh, so that's my two penny worth, you know. And, yeah, you know, thanks for Pat for holding back on his thoughts on Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Well, anyway, look, um, uh, gentlemen, I just want one final question. I'll do the rounds and then we'll wrap things up. Now, one of the things that we haven't spoken about, I mean, we spoke about the state actor's role in information war, but we haven't talked about the black hat versus white hat. You know, we haven't talked about the, the creepy guy in the cellar hunched over his computer doing whatever. And he's not necessarily in the pay of a state. He's probably just that, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier in the piece, that malicious dude, that nerd that just gets off on his little patch of power in that whole global infrastructure of the internet, you know, that he can do something or she can do something damaging and just enjoys that. What do we do in terms of protecting state assets, cyber assets against the continuing pilfering of our systems and probing from these non-state actors who don't necessarily have state affiliations? I'll start with you, Andy. It's, we've talked about nation state actors, but, you know, organized crime, mm. let's not ignore it. It's responsible for probably far more of the activity than any of the APTs that we've alluded to. There has always been a malicious actor individual. And uh, as Peter, I think, earlier said, you know, the problem is asymmetry. It's the low cost of entry to have a disproportionate effect. How do you, how do you stop it affecting state assets the same way you do for every other threat? They are no different. They're just as difficult to attribute. Uh, and, you know, in reality, the current activity in Australia may well be non-state. The suspicion is strongly that it's not a grand jury. But, you know, we can't attribute it. The problem is, you know, with nation state, you've got persistence. They will keep coming back. They will keep doing it. Whereas an individual is less likely to. Organised crime wants money. It wants profit. And so that's the sort of ransomware DDoS type attacks that we're seeing against some organisations. But, you know, the better defense, better protection, better defences is the answer. Pat? I entirely agree with Andy. I think that there are occasions when uh, these small groups of, um, be it organised crime or, or be it small groups of um, activists, activists as they're often called, uh, get suborned by uh, states to do their dirty work for them. That's nothing new. That's been going on since time immemorial. And it comes down to that thing of making sure the population are educated on these sorts of things. You know, the fact that now the banks are coming out and saying, well, we're going to make it a bit more difficult. You know, there are going to be some procedures you need to go through when you want to do something is really good. It's about time the banks took the initiative on this so that if I now want to charge something to my bank account, I can pick up my smartphone and do it. And then at some point they'll say, well, wait on a minute. I'm, you need to fill in bits of your password or you need to, you know, go and answer this email or whatever. That's the way to do it. It is to make sure that people are cautious because if individuals in a company don't click on a link, are assiduous and not putting any connection to the outside, you will secure them. You will secure those secrets and, and keep them where they're supposed to be. But it requires people to be educated and people to practice time and time again using good husbandry. Pete? I actually think it, it, it's sort of, <laughs> it's more complicated and less complicated than that. The, if, if I'm walking along the street and I hear somebody going, psst, psst, oi, over here, and I see some dodgy bloke, I don't, you know, go over to him. I think you're a dodgy bloke. And, uh, and, and um, you, you know, there you go. I, I, I want you to sign this because I've got a million quid for you. I'm sitting there thinking, no, you're a nutter. So it, it's that attitude that we have in normal life 
that you just have to go onto the internet. Why is it this, this credulity gap that suddenly appears because we're looking at a computer screen has always puzzled me. To go to Pat's thing, yeah, people need to be responsible. They need to grow up. I think that they should have been made responsible for looking after their computer systems ages ago. I can remember when I got a hard drive that um, Andy and I, we were doing a, a, an experiment and the, the, this good guy in, I think he was in South Wales, wasn't he, Andy? The, 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 the bloke, and we had all of these details of his family. And, and I said, oh, I know all of these, this, these things about your daughter and I've got all of these pictures. And he went completely bonkers. And he said, the government should be doing something about that. No, mate, it was your computer. You should have been doing something about it. You shouldn't have let us get hold of your hard drive. In terms of the, 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 the hackers, those hackers are actually a little bit easier to deal with, as Andy has made the point. They're after money. Organized criminals want money. They, and so you know where they're coming from. One sixth of all ransomware attacks, people pay the money out for ransomware. So that, you know, is, is the proof. They're, 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 they're doing that because they're making money. So people need to wake up again to the information age. Another reason for dealing, though, with those hackers who are allegedly just sitting there doing stuff for organized crime is there is a crossover, particularly in Russia, between organized crime and the state, because the, the Russian organized criminals are used as extraterritorials by the Russian state. I, I was in the office of uh, Len Hines when he was the head of the National High Tech Crime Unit, and they were saying that there was a particular individual that they had wanted to extradite, and the Russian um, state had turned around and, said to, and, and said, no, you can't have him, he's one of ours. So the, those links have to be broken. But again, all of this goes to this issue that we have about competition and being in the 21st century. All of these problems will continue unless we actually start to be much more ethical, much better as human beings. And this, this affects our long-term development in terms of things like artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Because an artificial intelligence program in, in fact, Professor Neil Lawrence made this point to me. There's a piece of technology which is fascinating. It's called Watts Governor. And it is a centrifuge that governs how much steam goes into an engine. It's an intelligent device. It is not intelligent. It doesn't, it doesn't have consciousness. It's a piece of metal that spins as a law of physics. Computer programs do what you tell them to. Tim and then David. I'm a little bit more cynical about the education part of this how you would implement it is kind of it, it is obviously up to policymakers and we're, we're just kind of making the point that it needs to happen but you know if we've said earlier in the in this discussion that the internet is a reflection of us and that the worst of it is also a reflection of us and we've also talked about how the media is not necessarily following up on their responsibilities and reporting it and perhaps that's down to the lowest denominator in terms of their audience i'm cynical about the education of, uh, of information technology uh, perhaps we need to accommodate the lowest denominator by introducing something like a license if you have the right to mm, technology phones internet or the access those kinds of things and that the government wants to be yes wants to be on top of our security as a nation and uh, on an individual basis then like cars which have the capacity to be dangerous within a, a society our citizens probably need some kind of license and registration. And part of that registration might even be that you need to meet the basic needs of having antiviral software, having possibly even having a VPN or something like that. So yeah, I would think that you would need to implement it in a way that it's not necessary. You need to, <laughs> the responsibility is on individuals, but you also need to um, put fail safes in there for the people who aren't going to take up the responsibility. Cause I'm, I'm just a little bit cynical about that. Final thoughts, David. Yeah, I can't help but sit here thinking about Foucault, you know, Foucault and the panopticon, that the best way to make humans behave is surveillance. The internet historically allows people who are motivated to avoid surveillance and other people think they're anonymous and behave poorly. So, you know, Pete's point from early on in this, that the biggest thing we need is to shine a light 
on networks that said this person did this and to remove as much anonymity as possible and accept this saves you having to drive three hours. Instead you can do it as a transaction, but it's visible. And I think the only way to get better behavior is actually going to be to increase visibility. And for those people who don't like it, they'll go to the dark web and you know, good luck to them. They'll find all the other weirdos just like them and they'll rip each other off. <laughs> but maybe if a proportion of us are willing to be in a more visible space where what we do can be seen and there is a, you know, a clear pattern and path to behavior, uh, we could at least get a moderately safer space that can then be extended to other people in other countries. So instead of having the five eyes that wants to hide everything, you know, we could have the 30 Ds, the 30 democracies that want to secure a relatively transparent environment. And I'm not going to assume like Pete that maybe we can improve our behavior, that we can evolve into being nicer critters. I'm going to say that with surveillance, we want to be nicer critters because we don't want to get the search light on us. That's interesting that you say that you want to sacrifice uh, privacy for safety, David. Yeah, but again, you and I have had this chat before and we both <laughs> don't have a massive problem with that. No, not at all. <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, gentlemen, that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today and for sharing your insights on Strategicon. And to our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can now also watch our podcast on video on the Strategicon Raw YouTube channel, easily accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. If you would like to support Strategicon, remember to check out our merch page. We have a wide variety of items to keep the Strategicon listeners satisfied. Until next time, goodbye. Oscast. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzcastNetwork.com for details.